I'm Zunair Azhar and this is Epicenter where we dissect, analyze and help understand major domestic and global stories. Today we'll be discussing the continuing shuttle diplomacy between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, the Iranian president's unprecedented visit to Pakistan in the middle of Gaza war and the US's response to it. We would also be talking about the flip-flops happening in the domestic political arena and while the extreme weather conditions in the country are asking for an acute climate vulnerability that Pakistan must address. To discuss this, we have been joined by Fahad Hussain, a senior journalist and political analyst. We are also being joined by Muhammad Malik, who is also a senior journalist and political analyst. And to join the Pak-Iran relationship, we have been joined by Ambassador Rifat Masood, who has a keen eye on the regional politics, especially when it comes to the Pak-Iran relationship. Uh, let's delve into the discussion. And Fahad, I'm coming to you. How do you look at this uh, shuttle diplomacy between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia? And as we speak, uh, Shahbaz Sharif, the Prime Minister, is in Saudi Arabia. And uh, the Crown Prince's visit is also approaching. What is at play here? I think the uh, diplomacy with, uh, with Saudi Arabia has really, really kicked up uh, into higher gear. Uh, the last couple of months, uh, with the, especially with the visit of the Saudi delegation, which was uh, led by the foreign minister. Um, what we've heard is that uh, during that visit, um, uh, some actual substantive work was done uh, in terms of investments and, and, Saudi, and Saudi ownership or, or Saudi in, involvement in, in, in uh, a lot of uh, important projects. So, so I think this, is, um, uh, this visit, which appears to be a follow-up to that visit, uh, uh, should hopefully see uh, some closures on some projects uh, in terms of uh, uh, investment coming into into Pakistan. Now, of course, we you know when the Saudi delegation came to Pakistan, there was talk of uh, many specific projects. Mm -hmm. Now, even if some of those uh, end up being um, signed upon, I think it will mean a significant amount of uh, investment coming into Pakistan. So that's a good news. The other, of course, is uh, also the fact that the Iranian Iranian president was in Pakistan recently, and a, a follow-up uh, and a visit to the Saudi Arabia right after that important visit also means that in terms of regional context, Pakistan is playing an important role. So all in all, I think so far everything looks positive, and if uh, this visit is followed up with uh, the visit of the Saudi um, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to Pakistan, I think that's going to um, have a very uh, significant impact on, on the way that uh, bilateral relations are taking off. Right. Mr. Malik, how do you look at it? Because Iran is new in the equation. Uh, Saudi Arabia has always been our go-to country when it comes to our economic needs. And uh, uh, with the Gaza spillover and whatever is happening in Middle East, U.S. is not very happy about it. So how well they are going to take it when it comes to Pak iran relationships? Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a big question mark uh, because, like you said, Saudi Arabia is a go-to country for us. But not without the American support, it's no longer a, a go-to country. The Saudis do play a hand in glove with, with the Americans. So the way the Saudis came uh, in such a big, high-profile manner and everything, and now Prime Minister going there for, uh, to participate in the investment uh, conference. But obviously on the sidelines, things will happen. The bad news is that our people had projected something like 25 billion in initial investments. It's down to 5 billion. The good news is it's still better than no investment at all. So it's not a bad thing. Now, unless Iranian president's visit had something to do with Pakistan playing some behind the scene thing in sort of bringing down the Saudi Iranians talking to each other or bringing down the Iranian involvement in sort of uh, supporting Hamas or others, I don't know. I'm just uh, conjecturing. The timing of the Iranian visit was a bit uh, surprising for me, it still is, unless you know what's the real reason for that. Because it does, on, on the surface of things, it would rub Americans slightly the wrong way. Uh, Iran is a very sensitive issue for them. And uh, even in our past, while we talk a lot about Iranian brotherhood and, and friendships, 
um, I've had conversations at least two, three former army chiefs who also mistrusted the Iranian government. And they would tell me, you know, that they say something and they back off. They don't, don't deliver the way the others do. So our mutual mistrust is there. And just the sudden warmth and bonhomie after our strikes in Iran, Iranian strikes in Pakistan, does come as, as something that for me is still a little, um, I wouldn't say I'm very clear on that. So I think there must be a larger behind the scenes things. Otherwise, the timing does leave a lot of questions in my mind. Yeah, the timing is important. Ambassador Rifat, we understand that Iran is a neighbor, but that is not new. We understand that we need a calm border with Iran, and that is not new either. Uh, how do you look at the timing of Iranian president's visit, uh, keeping in mind that it was us who invited him? Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for this question. And um, you see, uh, Although we had invited them and uh, the Iranian president came at a particular time when uh, things in the Middle East and Gaza have uh, reached a very hot point, but we must remember that such visits are not planned or not, don't uh, are not taken out in, in just a spontaneous way. They go. There's a lot of uh, work behind the scenes in planning such a visit. And if you recall, when uh, President Raisi was elected as president of Iran, he, in his opening speech, he emphasized the need to develop strong relations with the neighborhood. And in that, he specifically was focusing on Pakistan relations. And on top of it, in January, when our relations uh, plummeted to a low with the strike that took place on both sides, I think the Iranians uh, felt rightly uh, that it, there was a need, uh, although the foreign minister had visited, the foreign minister initially spoke to our uh, caretaker foreign minister at that time, Jalil Abbas Jirani, they had phone calls and the temperature came down, and then the Iranian foreign minister himself visited Pakistan to sort of mend the fences, but they felt that perhaps a high-level visit, will, which is already in the pipeline, don't, don't forget it was already in the pipeline, it wasn't something that came out of out of the blue or it was spontaneous. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just accelerate it a little bit. Now, um, regarding uh, what the outcome is, I think the outcome we have to wait and see. Uh, at such a high level visits, of course, uh, we have a, a very uh, far-reaching joint statement that has been made. Uh, a lot of lofty goals have been promised. Yeah. But let's see uh, how we deliver on that, because I think it's more our delivery uh, which is in question because of the sanctions which Iran faces. So we are a bit careful when we are dealing with Iran. All right. Fahad, the people I've been talking to in Washington, they are very clear on it that U.S. is really, really serious about the sanctions thing. And it is not going to budge off uh, against it if Pakistan continue to do business with Iran. At the same time, we have legal binding to complete that gas pipeline. Uh, are we in a tight corner? We are, in fact, in a very tight corner, and um, and I think uh, a lot of blame uh, should be apportioned on, on our own side. I think, um, you, you know, I've also spoken with a lot of people to try and understand where things stand, and the sense that I get is that there have been a lot of mistakes at our end, a lot, lot of uh, decisions which could have been much better, as a result of which now we are at a position where we are legally bound to uh, go ahead with the pipeline, and if we don't, then Iran can take us to court and we could be slapped with a, a very heavy fine, uh, or, you know, some estimates say almost somewhere near 18 billion uh, US dollars. And and if we go ahead with it, then we uh, then we could end up being sanctioned by the US. So it's a very, very difficult spot that we are in now. How did we reach, it, reach here? Who were the people who should have taken more timely decisions? Were we late in um, understanding that, that, that we would uh, we could be taken to, to uh, into arbitration by by the Iranian government. All of these things uh, show uh, a lack of timely decision making in Islamabad. Anyways, right. that what is done is done. The fact is that now we are at a we are at a stage where we really need to take some decisions. I know there's a lot of work being done in terms of trying to figure out whether we can just um, push the decision further. Uh, down the road with the consent of the Iranians and, and try and find some, some other way. But I agree with you that the way that things look, um, it is unlikely that the U.S. is going to give us any kind of waiver. And those people within government who are saying that we could try and convince the U.S. 
uh, to give us a waiver, I think that's unlikely to happen. So we are in a very, very difficult situation, and that is why during the visit of the Iranian president, if you notice, there was no clear announcement about the pipeline project. Yeah, and if we look at the joint statement as well, um, it is very carefully worded, Mr. Malik, and both sides have avoided setting any deadline for the completion of the gas pipeline. Do you think it's more of a posturing from Iran to stay quiet on it? I actually, like I said, I, lo I like the word the ambassador used. She used the word lofty. So lofty always, in my mind, seems impractical or something. But I have a question. Uh, if I, is the ambassador still with us? Yeah, she's with us. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Ambassador, what I want to know is, like when you said these things are not planned, uh, a lot of groundwork goes and everything. So obviously, uh, the timing has to be agreed to both sides. So would it be uh, what is generally the time frame that we work in because i can understand the iranians wanting to visit at this particular time right after a high profile saudi visit to pakistan and pakistan closing up really warmly nicely to saudi arabia not that it was ever cold over there but still and maybe there was a statement in that okay let's cool down things a bit let's throw a little spanner in there i'm, I'm just being a, a, a party pooper right here right now but I like to feel that international politics and democracy, uh, uh, diplomacy works in very strange ways, especially in our region and, and with the Eastern way of thinking. So why would Pakistan agree to the timing of the Iranian president at a time when we would add to our problems vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia and, and, and America? We are at a very precarious state in both, with both those countries. Yes, Ambassador, you can respond to that. Yeah, so um, just let me uh, clarify a few things. First of all, as I mentioned, visits are not spontaneous. So there's a lot of planning in it. But sometimes a visit's timing can be uh, very significant, especially, as I mentioned, after the, the difficulty that uh, arose in our relationship in January. And I think Iran was trying. Iran made a miscalculation at that time. And now they knew that a visit was already in the pipeline. So they wanted to push it forward. And we also accepted it for two reasons, I feel. One was the situation in Gaza has taken a terrible toll, and it has taken a very strange twist. Not a strange twist, I would say, but a, a very dangerous twist, with Israel uh, itching to uh, expand the war into the region. And uh, no country except for Israel wants to expand the war. Israel has its own agenda. Uh, of greater Israel and of taking over uh, its neighboring countries. And no uh, Arab country, I think, would want that. Iran certainly doesn't want it. The United States doesn't mm -hmm. want it. China, mm -hmm. Russia. My and question is, do you think this no, timing was beneficial for Pakistan or would it create unnecessary yes, problems yes. for us? I'm just, just a question. No, no. no. I, I just wanted to flag one thing, that visits don't take place in a vacuum. I'm sure that when the visit of the uh, uh, visit was announced, uh, we had the uh, tacit, uh, should I say, ba backing both the United States and Saudi Arabia, because it was probably felt that because of our close relations with Iran, and mind you, uh, whatever people may think about Iran-Pakistan relations, we are close, and the Iranians do give weight to our voice. The reason, simple reason for that is because Iranians also know that we are uh, close friends of both Saudi Arabia and important allies of the United States. So whenever the Iranians want us to uh, or want to reach out to those countries, uh, many times they can do it through us, number right. one. Secondly, I think we also felt that because uh, the, uh, the dangerous situation in Gaza is developing uh, on an unprecedented level, it is good to have the Iranians over here hear their viewpoint, see where they're going, because they just exchanged fire with, this, uh, with Israel. And I think that is why the Saudi foreign minister uh, also visited just before he, uh, President Raisi came, because Saudi Arabia and Iran, don't forget, they are uh, rivals, but they are not enemies. So, That's Ambassador, uh, let me interject and here. So are you suggesting Pakistan that, that Pakistan has somehow been in a position through this visit to be an interlocutor between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran? I wouldn't like to put it in those words as you have, but I think that the fact that the Saudi foreign minister's visit preceded President Raisi's visit 
I'm sure some discussions took place with the, between the leadership on that. Then President Raisi's visit ended and its delegation from Saudi Arabia came and there was, I think, some briefings in the foreign office also. So I, I wouldn't like to use the word interlocutor, but I think that there is some kind of exchange of, of messages or exchange of views taking place. Okay. Because said, Gaza is taking a dangerous turn and nobody wants this war to escalate. So uh, there are, there's an exchange of views and now with the visit of uh, Prime Minister uh, Shabash Sharif going uh, for, uh, to Riyadh and then the possibility of another visit, uh, a high level visit coming from Saudi Arabia. I think this is all in that, uh, in that strain. The okay. other thing you must remember is that of the past one year, Saudi Arabia and Iran have also uh, dropped the hatchet to a large extent. Yeah, yeah by the intervention of China and some other yes, countries as well. The animosity that used to, and, and mind you, when I was in Iran, uh, this was already under discussion, the Saudi-Iran rapprochement. Uh, and in fact, President, the late, uh, the uh, late, um, ex-President Rouhani spoke to the former Prime Minister Imran Khan, who visited him then in Iran when I was there. And he did say categorically that if Pakistan can play a role in bringing Iran and Saudi Arabia together, Iran would welcome it. Okay. Pakistan has done so, and I'm quoting him, Pakistan has done so in the past and we would welcome any moves by Pakistan. So I think this is all all in the background. As I said, that's why I said th things don't happen in a vacuum. There's always something building up behind. Of right. course, acceleration of a visit can be because of, of situation on the ground. Yeah. Right, Fahad, but I'm still confused and I would like your viewpoint on it that nine days after the unprecedented attack of Iran on Israel, the president of Iran is in Pakistan. And we had that report coming out of U.S. State Department on the human rights. Then there was this statement on the sanctions and uh, U.S. was continuously throwing caution over engaging with Iran. Um, what were we thinking? Because at the same time, our finance minister was in Washington negotiating with IMF. Well, um, I'm sure that the visit of the Iranian president was, wasn't planned in, in one week, uh, you know, I'm sure that the planning was uh, was underway for for a long time, as is the norm when such high-level visits uh, take place. Now, so if, if that be the case, then clearly um, uh, it would have been extremely, extremely irresponsible uh, irresponsible of Pakistan to to somehow um, uh, have second thoughts on the visit after the Iranian uh, the Israeli attack on Iranian embassy and then a counter counter attack by by Iran so so i think uh, clearly uh, the, the visit of the of the president to pakistan was not in any way linked to what was happening in the middle east that that point 1 point 2 i think in terms of uh, uh, the iranian president coming to pakistan i think it, it became all the more important for that visit to take place uh, because as the ambassador was um, uh, saying very correctly that i think it's in pakistan's interest if uh, uh, it is engaging with iran and saudi arabia at the highest level and if the iranian president is coming to Pakistan at a time when Pakistan is also very deeply engaging with, with Saudi Arabia and the Saudi foreign minister was here just days before the Iranian visit. So I, th so I think it's worked out well for Pakistan so far and we are seeing uh, the, the, the results of this in, in, in the shape of uh, our prime minister there in Saudi Arabia right now and, 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 um, and hoping that we could, um, uh, we could have some economic as well as political dividends. Okay, so Mr. Malik, uh, uh, what do you think? Who is the final beneficiary of this visit? Iran or Pakistan? No, I, I think if handled right, everybody can can, can benefit from or that. Or is it a win-win? The only thing is when, uh, well, it's a bit too early to say it's a win-win, but it's not a loss-loss anyways. My only my only thing is when, when you play... Uh, I wouldn't say mediator or peacemaker, even if you're conveying a few messengers and stuff like that, you need a very, very smart foreign office working for you. And I have a very smart foreign office. Our smart foreign office is very smart. I'm not so sure about the foreign minister, though. Uh, this requires very daft uh, diplomacy, very, very sort of low-key interactions and everything. And uh, the personality of foreign minister is going to matter a lot 
if Pakistan needs to engage in such talks or such conveying of message and everything. Uh, the Prime Minister is a safe bet. He's okay. He's moderate. He's humble. He can do that. Okay, but can we say the same about the Foreign Minister? Can he keep things on the on the low? Can he keep it quiet? Can he keep it humble? I don't know. I have my serious doubts. So diplomacy is all about people. Diplomacy is not about uh, some technical machines. It's about how you interact, you build friendships, you build trust, and how much you can keep inside. And uh, I wouldn't be so comfortable Pakistan playing such a delicate role um, with the current uh, leadership of the Foreign Office. Let's put it like that, political leadership. All right. Um, Ambassador Rifat, do you see uh, any further diplomatic ties taking place between Pakistan and Iran at the similar pace? Definitely. Uh, I'm more optimistic than my uh, co-hosts uh, co, uh, in this uh, meeting, in this uh, Skype show. Actually, uh, you see, it is uh, both Iran and Pakistan are deeply interdependent upon each other. And I think uh, after the January strikes, I think both countries realized how, in, how much they need each other. So it is a requirement. When you ask this question, uh, Ms. Malik, my answer would have been that it is a mutual benefit for both countries. All right. Iran cannot afford to be pushed further into a corner. It is already pushed against the wall with the sanctions. It is facing a very severe economic crisis at home. We, too, are in an economic straitjacket. So um, although we are uh, benefiting a lot from the assistance uh, of uh, our neighbors, our uh, Gulf neighbors, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, we have got bailout packages from the IMF. Uh, we also rely on the United States to help us out. But I think no better uh, dependency, economic dependency can take place other than uh, cross-border trade. And I think that uh, we sh should be, and we would be, I think, uh, prevailing upon both Saudi Arabia and the United States to say, look, we know Saudi Arabia has less problems with Iran, as I said, but America has more. We can say, okay, you have problems with Iran. We appreciate that. But, you know, we are in a, in a very difficult situation economically, and we need to have this border trade. And the fact that we have opened up border markets says a lot that we are willing and, you know, that when you, nothing, as I said, nothing happens in a vacuum. The fact that these border markets were opened up, well, the United States did not uh, criticize us for that because border trade doesn't come under sanctions. This is an important point to remember mm -hmm. because we are helping local on both sides of the border. All right. So you see, we should build, a, we should make, take careful, calculated steps and build upon a relationship which can be sustainable on both sides. And I think that now with the leadership in Iran especially, and the realization on our side, how much we are dependent upon Iranian uh, goods, especially the energy uh, corridors, that we will be using our influence both in Washington as well as in Riyadh to try and enhance the, the trade corridor between, or, or solidify, at least make it well, sustainable. Of the course, for that, Iran. as Mr. Malik put it, we need a very fine diplomacy at play. Uh, when we come after the break, we will, we will be talking about some domestic politics at play. Stay with us. Welcome back to Epicenter once again. And let's discuss some domestic politics. A lot of flip-flops happening in the political arena. And of course, at the center of all is uh, senior leadership of uh, Sunni Tahad Council or PTI Imran Khan. A very recent statement for, from uh, a former federal minister, Shahyar Afridi, who is a senior stalwart of the uh, same party, who says the dialogues with the chief of army staff and the DGISI soon, instead of talking to the rejected rulers who found their way to parliament wire rigging. Uh, I have with me uh, Shandana Gulzar, who's a senior leader from Sunni Etihad Council slash PTI. Let's talk to her about it. Shandana, thank you so much for joining us. How do you look at this statement? Isn't it a little undemocratic while you're sitting in the parliament and you are refusing to talk to the political parties and you're ready to talk to the establishment? Thank you so much, Zunaira. I think uh, in Pakistan, we, we often have a, we used to have a problem of trying to cover the truth with dirt. Uh, as we say, brush it under the carpet. 
Uh, we've perpetually got our heads buried in the sand. Otherwise, Pakistan would not be on uh, the list of the poorest countries at 140 and 150 out of 170. So clearly, there's something very wrong with how this country is being run for the last 76 years, in particular, 40 years of these pseudo-democracies. First of all, let me define any family that is sitting in the National Assembly on premier seats, on ministries, or in the Punjab Assembly, the Sindh Assembly, these are not political parties to begin with. They're kleptocratic dynasties, they've, they're puppets, and they've been installed by their leaders. So it's really, for me, while I respect individuals within the parties, there are certain principled people within People's Party, within Noon League, within all the others. Unfortunately, the leadership is not for Pakistan. It's just to enhance their own uh, economic and uh, corruption uh, interest. So we leave that at that. That's my opinion. It doesn't have to be verified or agreed by with anyone. That's how democracy works. Secondly, these political parties are the direct beneficiaries of the fake no confidence that was carried out by General Bajwa at the behest of the Biden administration. What Sharia is saying is the following. What is the point in talking to the people who overturned a democratically elected government, installed themselves as, as puppets, destroyed this country uh, economically, followed by the caretaker, and now for the last uh, two and a half years have decimated this country's economy. They have brought us to the brink, and now they expect us to negotiate what with them? All right. Khan has not committed a single crime, none of our workers. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do we negotiate with those who have brought Pakistan to this position? We will negotiate, as is the, I don't know if you're aware of the Pakhtun culture, that even when we negotiate peace treaties, you will always negotiate with your enemy, and we have no problem. But right now, our enemy is the Biden administration, not but, the United States. And since Shantana, we're not going fact, to negotiate with another them. Another fact, because there are so many facts and realities at play here. Another fact is that why you think these dynasties are not legitimate to run the parliament, Absolutely. it is the same Absolutely. establishment that you have been blaming uh, for the ooster of your own government. It is the same establishment yeah. that you think has been meddling into the political affairs of the country. So how come you are ready to talk to the power brokers and not the political parties? That is the point. We're not, we don't think that the establishment is a power broker. We think the people of Pakistan are the power brokers. They brought PTI, they swept the PTI in a landslide election never seen before in this country on the 8th of February 2024. On the 9th of February, the established held another election for these corrupt uh, kleptocratic dynasties to bring them into positions of power. So they benefited. How am I going to bend and argue or negotiate with Shabazz Sharif? Please leave your own seat. Fair enough. Uh, point taken. Fahad, uh, I don't understand when uh, PTI or Sunni Etihad Council says that because they are corrupt, they are dynastic, we are not ready to talk to PMLN and People's Party. And they are sitting in the parliament with them as well. At the same time, they have been blaming and building a narrative against establishment, that they have been behind every turmoil in Pakistan, and now they are ready to talk to them. At the same time, there is this mantra of stolen mandate, which is true to a lot of extent, but how they are going to uh, hit the bee, uh, beehive and expect the honey com uh, coming out of it as well. This is something that I, I don't understand, that this is too much confrontation for them to handle. I'm, I'm, I was listening to um, uh, Shandana Saban. I, uh, I agree with her to a certain extent. I do agree that uh, the results of uh, the February 8 elections uh, are, do not clearly reflect the, the mandate of the people. I think that is absolutely true. And anybody who's watched those elections carefully uh, and, and followed the, the, uh, the happenings of uh, the evening after the elections closed, I think, can say that with a fair amount of confidence that uh, clearly, you know, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of tinkering in terms of... Uh, uh, the uh, the outcome. So so as far as that is concerned, I think um, I agree with her. Where I do not agree with her is uh, the black and white position that PTI is taken in terms of other you know, political parties. Now the reason why I say that is that you know if I go back to before the 2018 elections when PTI was kind of untested. It, of course, it had a, its government in the KP before that, but it wasn't tested as a national party before that. This black and white position served the party well, because we could always expect that when it came into power, it would actually do what it says. But the stint, the PTI stint in power from 2018 mm -hmm. till the vote of no confidence 2022, I think that that stint uh, pretty much showed that PTI is like any other party. I mean, it cannot talk of corruption without 
looking at how it ran Punjab uh, under the chief ministership of Mr. Bazaar, the corruption was rampant, rampant, and I repeat, rampant. Uh, it, PTI cannot claim uh, a high horse or a high moral position on domestic politics because its own ranks are filled with people who follow domestic politics. It cannot speak clearly in terms of uh, civil military relations because it was brought into power by the establishment and now it wants to get back into power through the establishment. So I think PTI's strength is the fact that it has popularity, but it should stick to that and not try and draw, draw parallels that exist only in its own mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Malik, is there a possibility of uh, placing a moral compass uh, in the center of the politics in Pakistan and for that matter anywhere because you can't see things in black and white as Fahad has pointed out. There are certain objective realities of Pakistan's politics. Uh, establishment is a major stakeholder. We all know the background that has been happening since 2013 and 2018. The way things have transpired, we have come to agree to this point that you have to sit on one table and talk about stuff. How do you look at this current statement from Shahyar Afridi that he is going to only talk to the establishment and not the political stakeholders? It's not a statement, it's a desire. Uh, let, let's be very clear. I have the highest respect for Shandana and especially she's gone personal hardship. She's been incarcerated, everything and she stood her ground. She's done a um, much handled it much better than a lot of men in, in, in the party and top leaders. So all, all all praise to her for that. But but I think they need to get make few things clear for themselves. Uh, the PTI people, they need to first understand or make it make a policy statement. Do they think army is part of the solution or part of the problem? Because when they are not in power, it seems to be part of the problem. When they are uh, uh, in power, it's part of solution. So I see a duplicity over here. Khan Sahib used to say, you know, I got my bills passed by getting the army in. I used to do this. We're on the same page. They used to boast about it. Then uh, Shandana just said, you know, Biden did it on the behest of um, Bajwa and the whole conspiracy. This conspiracy has been flip-flopped, I think, I don't know, more times than I can remember. I don't, I don't even remember now, did the Americans tell Bajwa, did the Bajwa tell the Americans, did Pakistan did this, or what Imran Khan said. So there's a constant flip-flop on that. Let's, let's get, out of that, get out of that. What I liked about PTI when it came to politics was a very strong moral high ground that Imran used to um, claim, and we loved it. Unfortunately, we, yeah, we object to see its implementation. There are some red lines always, Zunera, there are always some red lines. When you're talking about a democratic culture, there is a red line about you talking to what you call unconstitutional and undemocratic involvement of the army. I would like to ask the PTI leadership, under what rule, under what law, either constitutional, either legal, or any morality, what, under what guise would you talk directly with DGISI and uh, chief of the army staff? If they talk to you on politics, they are violating the article. They, they should be tried under Article 6. If you're doing that, you're doing the same thing. First of all, please give me the legal and the constitutional and the moral justification for doing so. Mm -hmm. I understand there are ground realities. I think the biggest mistake that PTI is making is trying to sit in a silo and force the army to talk to them. If they will talk to the, if they were to talk to whatever form of government is sitting there, People's Party, uh, PML, and all that, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Shandana a direct question. If she was the army chief, and she found out that Imran Khan had told his people, "All right, guys, talk to P uh, PMLN, talk to Bolana Saab, talk to uh, People's Party, and let's form a joint policy on how to deal with uh, extra democratic interference and blah blah blah." Would the army feel more pressure then? Or Imran Khan sitting in jail mm -hmm. and just shouting about it, I don't want to talk to anybody, I'll talk to you directly. And they don't have to talk to him directly. Power talks to power from a position of weakness. Right now, Imran Khan's popularity is at an all-time high. But the establishment is not going to contest any elections against them. They don't need to be popular, they just need to be powerful. It's as simple as that. And I think, and I've been saying it in my shows, the, the conversation these guys want to have, they'll probably, probably their best hope is when the establishment sees that it cannot hold Khan any longer inside prison, 
when all the legal options had failed. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, at that time we might see some backdoor negotiations opening up. Before that, I do not get this policy. Like right. you pointed out earlier, you hold them responsible for these assemblies, you are part of those assemblies. Mm -hmm. You hold them appointing the same speaker, you've took, taken oath before that speaker. You can't, you can't run with hair and hunt with the hound. It doesn't work that way. You either, if you talk about ground realities, then ground reality is about talking with other political parties and forming a joint thing. Look at the Charter of Democracy. Yeah, I was Look about to point People's that out. Look how when Party and PMLN united, yeah. when they united, they got a totally different outcome, political outcome. You cannot be in a silo and expect the whole world to fall into that silo. Yeah. You so, have to interact and you have to do things in stages. My way or the highway did not work for them when they were in power. I don't think it's going to work for them when they're in opposition also. Well, thank you so much, Shandana Gulzar, for joining us today. Uh, before I conclude this segment, uh, the amount of allegations that come from PTI or Sunni Ittihad Council, it keeps on snowballing. And I personally think at some point they would have to really boil it down to one point that is completely relevant to Pakistan and Pakistani people alone. Because with this amount of vendetta against the entire global establishment and the local establishment, I don't see things happening in a good way for Pakistan. Let's take a short break here. Welcome back to Epicenter once again. Pakistan is facing an unprecedented spell of uh, deadly snowfalls and rains. At least 45 people have died, including children. There are questions around the preparedness of the government for this climate change, uh, affecting the most vulnerable population of Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. To discuss this, we have been joined by Rumina Khurshid Alam, who is coordinator to Prime Minister on climate change and environmental coordination. Thank you so much for being with us today, Rumina. Uh, could you kindly elaborate on the specific measures that the government is taking to rehabilitate the effectives of these torrential rains and snowfalls in Balochistan and KP? Bismillah rahman rahim and thank you very much, Zunaira, for calling me on this show because I think media is one of the important forums uh, which through uh, this uh, forum we can raise our voices and we can tell the words for the awareness as well t towards the people. Uh, well, getting back to the subject when you said about the floods and the current situation, we all know that Pakistan is on the receiving end and of course I don't want to go into the repetition of that but you know, uh, that is one of the very important thing is that the coordination among the provinces because you know, after the 18th amendment few things have been devolved to most of the things have been devolved to the provinces but on this specific um, you know uh, uh, issues we uh, we are looking forward towards more stronger <coughs> coordination and how to get the things towards the betterment and for that matter of fact i'm sure you uh, knew that uh, uh, day before yesterday the honorable prime minister has made the committee as well and getting back on the subjects of course ndma and the ministry of the climate change under the leadership of the uh, mr uh, um, Mia Muhammad Shabazz Sharif, we all were trying our level best to do whatever for the betterment of the country and for the people as well. Well, uh, there is a report in front of me from Amnesty International and <clears throat> they concluded it by saying that Pakistan needs a very organized and operational rehabilitation assistance program. Uh, where, uh, where are we on that formulation of the board? Uh, for getting the fund out of the COP28 uh, uh, resilient fund that we had once uh, Mr. Bilawal Bhutto was foreign minister. Uh, are we done with the board formulation or there are still hiccups in that? Uh, well, uh, when you talk about the hiccups, like, well, well, I'll tell you that, uh, as I've told you, that uh, recently the Honorable Prime Minister has made the committee as well. And, you know, uh, there are f some challenges, but I, uh, they, they were uh, the challenges in the past, but now I think our stance is very much clear, and uh, whatever, uh, if the small hurdles are, uh, will come, definitely they're going to be sorted out in a very proper way. And when we talk about the losses uh, or the funds about, of course, the losses were being great, uh, unfortunately, 
fortunate unfortunate a greater number of uh, the losses but now obviously when you said about the organized mechanism i just wanted to show you that uh, we all are on one page because of course it's a matter of a country and we all are uh, definitely uh, working strongly and uh, as um, uh, national disaster management uh, along with them you know early warning systems how we can work how we can work along with the provinces what sort of a, uh, uh, the needs are being there so we all are on one page and we are trying our level best to get the things done in an organized way and try to face those challenges which are uh, although either in the past of course what we have learned a lot so now in the coming days as well we are trying our level best to you know get more things organized more in a better way and new way well rubina we all know that <coughs> pakistan's contribution to the carbon footprint and greenhouse gases emission is 0.9% yet we are the most vulnerable country and no country like pakistan can deal with this kind of a non traditional threat <laughs> on its own can you elaborate on how the un is helping us or how the rest of the world is helping us well to be very honest i think it's always one of your one need to be strong on our grounds like i would really like to tell that when you talk about uh, the pdm uh, times when we uh, were facing that uh, huge challenge that time as well the parliament and the government all were like they, everybody everyone has played a great role uh, in that and everybody tried their best that we should all need to get all the not only that intent uh, attention to get the things done for the country and to make the world uh you know uh, to get on pace uh, not only on that one stage like to that they should uh, be contribute uh, for uh, because uh, not in the form of the aid mm -hmm. i believe that it's we all know those uh, those countries who those developed countries who are being the greatest uh, contributors uh, to all this, this. Uh, vulnerability yeah contributors and those who made us the vulnerable who brought us in this position where we become the vulnerable countries Absolutely. i think now it's the time for them as being a country we always raise our voices and uh, i truly believe that we are not looking for aid in uh, zunera we are looking for the trade and that's the right of these countries who are becoming vulnerable because of these countries and of course when it's come to the un uh, whatever the part is un is uh, uh, you know do, uh, doing but i believe that this region needs to be more stronger because we, we cannot go mix apples with the oranges or it's a, not like a tablet or panadol tablet that everybody should Absolutely. get one tablet and yeah. the same for yeah. this matter for this matter every it, the solutions should be go towards the region wise and we are looking for those solutions i'm uh, i'm trying to gather because honorable prime minister uh, this is this subject is obviously this is not only the subject this is a matter of a fact which is very much important and alarming uh, we all are trying our level best to get the world's best people for this cause and to engage them and to get the best expertise uh, either it's a carbon footprint uh, either it's the uh, you know uh, whatever the issues or the challenges that how we have to sort it out and i'll make sure uh, i will try my level best because i don't say that this is me or it's only one or two person this is for all because this nature is belong to every everyone yeah. and it's not a subject now for a one country because whoever is going to do something wrong the impact of that thing is going to be uh, for others as well or other also have to serve so i believe strongly uh, zunera that this is now a time it's now or it's never we have to stand up for each other until and unless we'll wait that somebody will come or maybe they're going to do something it's that times have been history now we have to raise the voices in a proper way and in which i believe that alhamdulillah pakistan is doing great we have done in the in the previous cop as well and um, uh, inshallah in this coming uh, time as well we are looking for the best and my so i believe in one thing that we need trade not aid yeah. and we want the the things to be done in a right way and people should know that who are the responsible for this they can't i believe that they should not in my opinion i strongly believe that now it's their time it's a high time for them to you know uh, to contribute not only contribute because i think it's their duty to do that as well you're absolutely spot on on that because uh, you have to phrase the things right first of all and the climate justice is the right way to put it because we are the victim here we have not been contributing that much of yeah. the carbon emission and everything that has brought all these torrential rains and snowfalls on us so do you think 
that there is still a need to sensitize the world of the effects that Pakistan is getting of their doings and also internally speaking we also need to sensitize our own people our own policy makers to focus more on this climate change uh, mantra that is usually considered till now something very cosmetic well, I, uh, to be very honest, Zanera, this is not cosmetic. This is now something I call that it's in, it's in a very serious it's and a very serious uh, situation. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's it's a threat, and it's uh, all the time a threat, which is like we are in the all uh, in the emergency situation because nothing is like you you can't predict anything. Situations are very much unpredictable, and you know this is something when you talk about the policymakers. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that in the previous like in the PDM times we. We had um, uh, parliament in the parliament hosted IPU conference of Asia region, which I hosted, and in which we have put the, put that thing into the stance that now it's a time to stand for each other, and we have done the lobbying to bring sensitize this, this issue, and not only the sens uh, sensitization is the issue because now this is you know at the same time when our country Pakistan was suffering from the floods and another country suffering from um, like other region you can say was suffering from the doubts, so, you know everything is. Very very much there. So now uh, I'm talking. We are talking about for the policymakers. I would really like to show you that everyone is on the page. And in fact, um, we are constituting one uh, along with a few uh, people. We are making an international parliamentarian uh, green co climate caucus in which, like you know, one should support each other mm -hmm. because without uh, this, you can't get for the solutions. We need to do the lobbying. We need to do the negotiation with those countries who are the main people. You have used the word of the climate justice. I, of course we believe that you know because you know when you need when you talk about your right for that right you need to be right as well and you need to pitch how the way the things are so for that very much um, I would really like to ensure that the policy makers uh, are uh, still on one page but the most important thing when we talk about our public when we talk about our people you know it's very little un not little it's unfortunately uh, you know uh, something when we talk to few people uh, they they don't they've not much aware like i really from your bio uh, through your program i would really like to uh, you know convey this message to the people that you know it does not mean that we are not the contributors like we are the vulnerable but still we are on, if we are on the receiving end but still we should not be become the part of that to make it more vulnerability to go mm -hmm. towards more towards the vulnerability by using the plastics mm -hmm. you know by using those things which are harmful and by for the planet. you know you like we we try we are not yeah for the planet so i think uh, we uh, I, I believe that uh, the earth day which was been uh, i don't use the word of celebrated that uh, but the 22nd observed. april which was the earth day yeah. and that i uh, yeah the been observed but you know few, sometimes few people said that okay we are celebrating in this word we are celebrating nature but that today is why we Rumiha. had a Magda, that is uh, why Magda Hills. I think that we have talked about the international I community. just want to say uh, yeah one one thing Go ahead. Uh, no just one thing Go ahead. Uh, Zunera yeah. I wanted to see uh, I wanted to say that you know just today we had a mag on Magla Hills we had a marathon as well so these sort of the activities which we are planning but you know more important is to save this nature when we say that we are celebrating nature I think now it's a time that we need to think that are we the is the nature is happy with us mm -hmm. no it's not the nature is sad from us mm -hmm. so now is our time to pay our responsibility because if the planet is not going to be in the good position how we can survive and what we're doing for our uh, coming uh, nations so I think that's the high time that every p single person should be on one page other than the differences we need to be strengthen each other we need to strengthen the country well you have our platform always available to you whenever you need it and we can do it in a very collaborative thank way thank you so much Ruma, for joining us and this concludes the epicenter for this week